gosh, college graduation. Mm. Yes. Well, right on. That's a cool place. It is a really cool mm-hmm. place. Every year I think I'm going to go, and then for whatever reason I don't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Most of my family lives there. Most of your family lives there? That's what? Yeah. You're Egyptian? I am. That is so fucking cool. <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah. Half on my mom's side. That is so cool. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. I I mean, I really feel like I've had multiple lifetimes there. That's all I'm going to say. So, okay, I'm very excited about this. Um, so there's so many things that we could talk about. Yeah? Yeah. Um, Anything. I, many things that we could talk about. Okay, so um, did you – you have family there. Did you visit, like, regularly as a kid? Did you uh, travel there or did, did you ever live there at any point? No. Um, I visited twice uh, when I was younger, I think – when I was, I don't know, 14 and 16. Um, and my, uh, I mean, it was an amazing experience. It was the furthest from home I'd ever been. Uh, and so, yeah, I have a, an enormous family, um, like more aunts and uncles and cousins and things that I can possibly <laughs> ever get to know. Um, so it's a it's a bit overwhelming, but everybody uh, takes pride in feeding you as much food as you can possibly eat. Like the Italians, mm-hmm, they're very nice. Uh huh. Um, Where in Egypt? Um, Cairo and Alexandria, and most of them live in a, a smaller place called Benha. Do you know how to speak the language at all? Only very little anymore. Do you understand it? A little. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you were to go over, you wouldn't feel totally out of water. Yeah. I I, I, uh, I know enough to learn Arabic in Arabic again. Wow. Yeah. That's really cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it, was, it was awesome to learn. I mean, of course, we came back to the middle of the forest in Washington State uh, and had very little application for the language. So I've forgotten most of a it. lot of it. Yeah. So you grew up in Washington. Yeah. Where did you grow up in Washington? Harstein Island. Uh, On an island? Harstein Island in the Puget. Yeah, it's in the Puget Sound. It's in the very like, sorry, southern, <laughs> it's okay. southern, southern nook of the Puget Sound. Wow. Um, on a farm in the woods. On a farm? Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah. Like what kind of animals? Sheeps, chickens, ducks, turkey. Sheeps. <laughs> uh, we had goats for a while. We had horses. Um, like every kind of bird ever, quail and pheasant. And, yeah. Wow. That sounds so amazing. Did you like it? I hated it at first. Um, what did you hate about it? Well, I grew up in Southern California with a big chunk of that, you know, large extended family around us at the time. <clears throat> Wait, you're from Southern California? Yeah. I didn't know that. Well, I was either. born in Southern California. When I was seven, I moved to the island in Washington. Um, and when we were in California, we my mom has eight brothers and sisters, and they've got kids. And at the time, we still had our grandparents there, and a huge community of friends, and it was kind of amazing. Um, and then uh, something changed with my dad's work, and. He had to start working in Tacoma and Seattle, so he moved us to Washington, and we left our um, family and community back in Southern California. So, uh, I, yeah, we hated it. Um, it took a little while to um, really accept and appreciate living in a like rural country type area. Um, being surrounded by forest and nature instead of uh, people that like you. Um, <laughs> that was, yeah, it took a minute. Okay. But I'm, I'm very glad it happened. Mm. Because Southern California is very different. Yeah. and It would have been a very different way of growing up. It would have, uh, yes. I, I would not have been me, I don't think. <laughs> okay, so how did it make you me? Or you? Um. I 
think that the solitude and connection to land and nature uh, changed just how my brain developed. Hmm. Uh, I love the outdoors. Um, uh, it makes me pretty sad. That's, you know, that basically all of nature is being destroyed. Um, mm -hmm. It makes me really sad too. Yeah, but in the meantime, I'm content enough to learn as much mm. as I can about it and hopefully someday be able to do something to help mm. uh, if past lives takes off. Uh -huh. I think you're already doing something to help. Yeah, I it, think so. It just maybe isn't as big as you want it to be yet. It's time to grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to slide and grab my tea here. Yeah, go second. for it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's hard to get too. Sorry about that. It's all good. So you grew up in Washington mm -hmm. in a very rural era, area. Sorry. And how many like brothers, sisters, who were your siblings? What did your family look like? Tell me more about that. Well, I have a mom, a dad, and a brother and a sister. Okay. Uh, I'm the youngest. My sister is the middle child and my brother's the oldest. Okay. Mm -hmm. And is there a large span of age in between all of you? Or are you kind of all we're compacted? We're four years apart. Each of you. Mm -hmm. So like they did it on time. Yeah. <laughs> That's yes, cool. Yes, they did it on time. They actually planned, they planned it. I, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't asked, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So you grew up there. Nobody liked it, it sounds like. And when you say we didn't like it, I'm assuming you and your siblings. Yeah, me, my siblings, and dad did not. Or, and my mom. Anyway, my dad loved it. He wanted to be a cowboy, and that was a big part of his motivation. I think. Really? Yeah. Um, and... What did he mean by cowboy? Oh, I mean... just Like living out in the Wild West, like Little House on the Prairie style? Yeah, or? and like Kevin Costner movies. And, <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. All right, and your mom was not having it? No. No, I mean, her family was... Uh, like, it's a very, very tight-knit family. Yeah. So it's... I mean, it still is hard for her... Um, and I, I do hope that someday we can figure out how to get her closer to family. Mm. Um, because she's, um, she's disabled. She can't walk and being in the middle of the woods is not an easy thing. She's recently, you know, I mean, I, arguably she's always made the most of it, but, um, she's figured out like public transportation services to bring her into town. You know, it's like 25 minute drive from uh, the nearest town, Shelton, Washington. Um, and, you know, they've got a library there, which she loves. It's just, you know, difficult for her to get around, but she's, you know, she's figuring it out. And just, uh, I think she just completed her associate's degree. Um, uh, she's been taking college classes forever. Um, and then she had to stop for some medical stuff. And then I think just this last quarter, she uh, continued with like online classes to finish it up. And she's super excited about it. I bet she is. Yeah, she loves learning. She, I don't, I don't know that she like has an intended career track or anything with it, but she just has loves to learn. Loves, yeah, our house has been completely full of books for as long as I can remember. Do you love to read? Yeah. Um, I, I haven't read much in the last two years uh, since I got out of prison. While I was in prison, I read probably thousands of books. Uh, and I loved to read before that, but I started Past Lives immediately after I got out. Um, and that has swept up my entire life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot to take care of a business and to take care of so many other people. You take care of a lot of people. Yeah. We have like 12 employees now and a hundred something members. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> um, well, it's pushing up against how worthy you feel of it and also against um, like the idea of what success means to you. And mm. it's going to keep doing that. 
Yeah, as it continues to grow, right? And and you're the person that's standing in the way of how fast it grows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I mean, at times I do feel like a, a <clears throat> you know, bottleneck. A, a bottleneck on the on the entire organization. Um, I've never done anything like this before. I've never been in charge of such a large and capable team, um, and I have a past that kind of screws with me today. Of course it does. Um, so it, you know, certainly challenges my sense of self-worth. Of course it does. You know, on a regular basis. So that's, I think, you know, my, yeah, my sense of self-worth and my acceptance and identity as a leader um, is, I think at this point, the single greatest point of investment that I make in myself or in the company. Well, you're pretty amazing. Nah. <laughs> I mean, remind me again how old you are? I'm 28. You're 28. Yeah, at 28. <laughs> Let's compare our lives for a second. <laughs> at 28, I hadn't accomplished anything yet except for having a daughter all by myself, which was – That is impressive. Impressive. That is impressive. It's a totally different life. But I hadn't created or germinated something as large as what you're currently doing. I was just trying to – my life was a fucking mess. I was just trying to keep on top of that mess mm -hmm. because of all my trauma and my history, right? My history was yeah. definitely impeding my decision-making skills for sure. Mm hmm. Okay. So, um, for everyone who's listening or watching, you dropped prison, right? And a lot of people don't know about your past or past lives. So, ah. um, do you mind sharing any part of your story? Um, let's start small, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe. Um, would you mind telling us how you ended up in prison? Not at all. And I'm, uh, I'm quite comfortable sharing any okay. part of the story. Okay. Um, there are uh, perhaps certain people's privacy that I'll respect, but um, uh, I – well, first of all, how much time do we have here? We have as much time as you want. Yeah. Okay. So uh, it's uh, – it is a rough one. Um, I – accidentally took the life of one of my friends uh, in a car wreck that I started because, or that I caused because I was uh, extremely high on LSD. This happened in Ashland, Oregon in 2016. And uh, because of that, I was uh, charged with, uh, well, originally charged with manslaughter in the first degree. Um, and it was brought down to criminally negligent homicide. Um, the difference being manslaughter indicates, uh, an extreme disregard for the value of human life and, uh, criminally negligent homicide indicates just you're a fucking idiot and someone died. Um. So uh, instead of 10 years in prison, I ended up with a 80-month sentence with um, oh, earned time opportunities and uh, uh, the chance to get into an alternative incarceration program at the tail end of my sentence to save a little bit of extra time. Oh. So that's how I ended up in prison. Uh, I got high on LSD and tried to kill myself and took out one of my friends instead. Do you mind sharing why LSD was the option? So even before the accident, my mental health was completely deteriorated and I was suicidal and paranoid, no, nothing, not my... None of my executive functioning or ability to communicate or trust people was there anymore. I mean, I was I was very lost 
I knew like I was going to die or I was like something was going to happen. Like I knew that this could not continue anymore. I'd been holding on for as long as I could trying to make it work in college. And, um, I in fact tried to start, uh, my first attempt at a collective, uh, in the middle of all that before, before the accident. And that's, um, that's what my friend was trying to help me get started. Um, uh, there was another person in the, in the car with us that was, uh, also unharmed. Um, I wasn't injured and sh we met because of this collective that I tried to start out of my apartment in Seattle. A at any rate, uh, I was a wreck. And what kind of collective? I, so I've been dreaming on this idea of building like a small business centered collective uh, for a very long time. Um, it actually ties back to uh, my family's initial move to Washington. So at one point, you know, we all lived in a very like, tight area within Southern California. And my parents were sort of the uh, financial and emotional uh, security of the rest of the squad. And when we moved, the rest of my family didn't have that support anywhere. I mean, there was a, anymore. There was a time where, you know, if somebody got into any kind of trouble or lost their job or, you know, with, they would come to your family for uh, help. Yeah, they'd come to us for help, and um, there were pretty regularly, you know, uncle, mostly uncles, um, uh, crashing at our house for a little while, joining, you know, joining our household and. And it was great. And it wasn't like a judgmental thing or anything. It was just like, oh, sweet. Like, you know, uncle whatever's here. Oh, great. Like, I hope I hope he stays forever. Um, and so, yeah, there was there was a there was a lot of there was a lot of support and love and community. And when we moved, they didn't have that anymore. So they kind of had to figure it out on their own. And everybody scattered across the U.S. Um, seeking cheaper housing or a job or a uh, marriage or whatever the hell. Mm -hmm. And watching that unfold was a horrifying thing. Um, the, I mean, the, the moment that we moved, like me and the other kids, we were, uh, well, we were devastated and we were very resolved. Like, we're going to fix this. We're going to, we're going to bring this back together. Like no idea what the adults are doing. They're fucking crazy. Like we need to fix this. And <clears throat> asking all the adults, uh, like, what's going on? Why is this happening? Why would you all ever do this? Why would you scatter like this? This is insane. Well, housing is expensive and people need jobs. And we're like, well, well, let's get a big, let's just get one huge house. We'll just get a huge house and we'll live together and it'll be amazing. And then we'll always be around each other forever. And they're like, that's crazy, kids. You know, adults need privacy. Um, and also like we would need work. Well, let's start a business. Let's start a family business and let's start a bunch of businesses and it'll, it'll be this great thing and we'll have a swimming pool and it's going to, it'll be great. Uh, look at you with the vision. <laughs> um, and I never dropped it. I know you've been trying to recreate that ever since. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know what I know what community is supposed to feel like. Like I remember it, even though I was a kid. I know what it's supposed to be, and I know that most of what we have going on in the world isn't it. Um. So, you know, that was my you know seven year old solution to the thing. And as I grew up, and I don't know things on TV or things on the internet, started learning about communes and intentional communities and you know different similar models holy shit people do this this is a this is a real thing i was always trying to create it too yeah um as an as a young adult yeah uh, I, was, I was trying to always get all my friends mm -hmm. in one spot i was like how about you buy the house next door and yeah. <laughs> yeah um and 
yeah, there's just an instinctive drive in me to create community. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, on a for on yourself a... and for other people. I see that. So I've had this. I've had this idea, and it was very rough when I was young, uh, and just from adults, I knew that the main thing that was missing is money, right? Yep. If you have money, then you can you can f do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And um, so I decided I'm going to become a doctor. Doctors make a bunch of money. I'll be able to help people while I earn a bunch of money, and then I'll be able to build my thing and you know and bring my family back together. Is that what you went to college for? Originally, yeah. Um, and I took my associates. Um, when I was 18 and went to the University of Washington in Seattle. And I, I at the time, I was thinking, I'm going to get a bachelor's in chemistry or something and uh, go on to pre-med, however that would work. And right around that same time is when my mom started going through some horrific medical trauma that... Uh, persisted for, I don't know, the better part of five years and got a taste of malpractice and uh, doctors and insurance and lawyers in real life and realized I didn't want nothing to do with it. I didn't want a damn thing to do with the medical industry. And so I changed my uh, intention toward engineering instead. And I had already been loaded up on science and math based classes from the um, like pre med track, and I just needed to get like electromagnetism and programming and some mathematics. Uh, and I think it really should have only taken like another year or something to wrap up all of my prereqs, but uh, my as I said, my mind was pretty screwed at the time, so. You mean just emotionally because of how much you were dealing with when it came to your mom? Yeah. And so I became very good at submitting hardship withdrawals and tuition reimbursements and uh, taking classes and failing them and getting my money back so I could try again. Um, and, yeah, two-year uh, degree or, you know, getting, getting into my bachelor's program should have not taken that long at all, but, uh, it was another two or three years actually longer before I was like one quarter away from entering my electrical engineering program. And at the time I'd taken a leave of absence from the university of Washington, uh, my like paranoia and everything was just too much. And I was in and out of some pretty significant mental health breaks for years. So I decided to take that leave of absence from the U University of Washington and uh, go back to the community college that I took my associates from. Just a smaller scene, know all the professors. Maybe I'll actually be able to have like some friends that I see every day instead of just being one of 20,000 students or whatever it is at UW, you know, 600 student stadium rooms. And it's not my, not my vibe. Don't yeah. like it. Yeah. Um, and I did, I made a, I made a little friend group there. And for a while it seemed like it was going a lot better uh, until it wasn't. And this was where in Oregon? This was in Washington. Okay. Yeah. I'm not from Oregon at all. Right. For some reason, I thought you were down in Eugene, though, you said. How did you end up in Eugene? Uh, I thought you were there for college. Sorry, I misunderstood that at some point. No. Uh, the University of Washington in Seattle okay. is where I ended up in college. Um, I don't know if I've ever been to Eugene at all. Um, so, yeah, back at community college, little friend group. Uh, meet this uh, meet this guy, Ryan. Um and I'm recovering from the, uh, you know, aftermath of this first collective that I 
started and failed and out of my apartment on Alki Beach in Seattle. And uh, yeah, that was a mess. I had no idea what I was doing. I just moved a bunch of strangers into my apartment. We built bunk beds. It was pretty sweet. And <laughs> yeah, we're just, yeah, we'll build bunk beds. Rent will be super cheap. We'll have a bunch of people live there and we'll start a bunch of businesses. It'll be great. Super idealistic. It was a complete fucking mess. Um, so I left. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, You're idealistic like me. That's funny. Yeah. Uh, Went back to Bremerton and met Ryan. And, uh, you know, I've never really stopped this, like, collective idea. Uh, it's always on my mind and it's always just spewing out of my mouth. Um, and my buddy Ryan was really into it and was super supportive through all the mental health shit that I was going through. Um, so I was starting a, uh, a small business in private tutoring for math, chemistry, and physics. And Ryan was helping me book all my appointments and, um, oh, you know, it was his first little job. Um, he was 18. I was 21. And more stuff happened with my family. More stuff was going on in my social life. And I started to snap again. And, uh, my mom had left our like family van in Southern California. Uh, she was going to divorce my dad. So she had me drive down there with her to bring her to fam, bring her to be with family. And I flew back up to Washington, leaving the van so that I can continue my, my classes. And I don't know, another quarter or something later, it was close to finals week. Uh, my mom tells me that she's flying back to Washington and is going to get back together, together with my dad. And she wants me to fly down to Southern California and drive the van back up. And I thought, all right, this is an opportunity to do something cool and get sober. And uh, so I invited my new buddy, Ryan, and uh, a girl that I just started dating, Tiana, who was like the first member of that failed collective in Seattle, um, by the way, which is fun. And we flew down to Southern California, picked up the van and drove it uh, all along US 101. It was a beautiful. It is a beautiful drive. Yeah, beautiful drive. I went camping in Big Sur and. Uh, it's my favorite. Yeah, Big Sur is like my favorite place. It's my favorite. Um, and yeah, we decided to cut out a Big Sur a day early, I think, because um, I wanted to show them Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. And so we deviated off of 101 and went to San Francisco. And our plan was to stop in Golden Gate Park and barter with hippies and come home with a bunch of souvenirs and crystals and, you know, cool stuff for the, you know, from the trip. And uh, a lot of people there had acid, and I was curious. Um, Is that the first time you'd done it? No. Okay. Um, I had tried acid one time, and nothing happened. Uh, and it just, I just felt a little weird, right? Just a hit of acid. Um, and, and nothing happened? <laughs> yeah. That's unbelievable. The first time I took acid, it it melted my mind. Um, <laughs> I like, I just, I'm impressed. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> and then the second time that I had tried acid, it was a little bit more intense. Um, you know, some visuals, but nothing really like, I just didn't understand what like the big deal was. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um. So you had to double down, right? Yeah. So you took we more. ended up in, yeah, ended up in Golden Gate Park and I'd been on this like this uh, other just trip to go on a spirit quest, right? I'm on, I want to like, I want to clear my mind and find out who I am and, you know, cure my traumas and whatever. And, and my dumbass thought that I could do it by eating a bunch of acid. Um, 
you know, I didn't really have any answers anywhere else. Um, so while we were in Golden Gate Park, I traded somebody there for um, quite a lot of acid. What's quite a lot? Um, Do you mind me asking? I think it was like, I don't remember exactly. It might have been like 11 or 13 hits of acid or something. How many did you take? Well, I ate all of them. Um, not all at once. So you were like microdosing them. I don't know if it could really be called microdosing them. Uh, uh. <laughs> well, I mean, in the sense that you were taking a few and then yeah. an hour or two later taking a few. And yeah, then... taking like one at a time. Okay. Um, so yeah, you were dosing yourself. Essentially. Yeah. yeah. Um, Did you? So on our way out of Southern of uh, San Francisco, I think I ate my first amount, whatever that was, of uh, gel tabs they were. And um, I, I, you know, had a whole plan with Brian and Tiana. Like, I, you know, I've taken acid before and nothing really starts happening for me anyway until like two hours later. So. Tiana, why don't you get yourself a chance to sleep because you're going to be driving the rest of the way. Um, and so we did that and I drove us up north and like literally still like nothing is happening, right? So I stop, we buy food at a grocery store, eat eat treats and go uh, continue going north, um, stop at a gas station, get more snacks, fuel up. Still nothing's happening. It was probably like three hours at this point. And I'm like, all right, well, maybe the same thing's happening where I'm just, maybe I'm just like resistant to it. So I eat some more and continue driving north. And then I can tell that it's starting to kick in. I'm like, okay, cool. Pull over. Tiana gets in the driver's seat. Um, at first I was going to go in the passenger seat and then I changed my mind. I was like, I don't, I don't want to be anywhere near the front of this vehicle. Um, and the back of the van was folded out into like a bed there's blankets and stuff and so I went in the back and uh the acid started kicking in and uh it was at first exactly what I like, hoped it would be yeah um and I was like at a you know at a at a pretty good place a pretty intense place but um mostly it was just like wow things are so cool better take the rest of it right cuz yeah i mean this more a, of a good thing is never a bad thing yeah i mean in, like when you're high <laughs> yeah like see, seeing cool visuals and like and like feeling cool doesn't really make a spirit quest in my mind right so right so you got to take it up a notch mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and then it did really become amazing for a minute and then it got scary um and uh we had come into view of mount shasta uh, which was stunning covered in snow full moon stars everywhere it was insane and that was very high so that alone was a uh that was just a magnificent thing to behold and then we started going through the pass and it was really late it was probably midnight or later um and there was so much fog and there was a full moon, so it was all like illuminated quite a lot. And all I could really see out of any of the windows was just like bright white light. Mm -hmm. So it's made more intense. Like this real driving hazard is made more intense for me by the fact that I'm tripping on acid. And I don't really understand that it's like fog and moonlight and whatever. Uh, I thought we died or that something was terribly wrong or whatever. So uh, I have them pull over. And I get out and I do a four point inspection on the vehicle. Like doesn't appear to any doesn't appear to be any damage on this thing, so uh probably this isn't the real van and I'm like lost in somewhere in my mind and I knew that I ate acid 
and this isn't real and I need to escape because I'm trapped in this like like alternate universe or or I'm trapped in hell and or something else or I don't know my like mind just kept shifting around what this perception was but none of it was good like I had to get out of it um I had to get back uh I remember feeling that too and the only way to go about that in my mind was to kill myself so uh, I asked them for the keys they gave them to me and we got in the vehicle um, I almost took off without them. I mean, in my mind, they weren't even like the real versions of Tiana. Them. Yeah. Um, and then I got back on the road. Uh, we had taken the Ashland exit and found a turnaround. So we pulled back on the road and I pushed the van up to 95 miles an hour as fast as it would go and just took a right on purpose, thinking everything was going to be okay. Uh, Did they know? So this was all going on in your mind and you didn't express it to them. Meaning you weren't like the only way out is me killing myself right now. No. I mean, I was talking crazy shit, but. Yeah. Um, but they were like, you're high. No, actually. Um, they were being kind of vague and hippie-ish about the whole thing. And I think just trying to like encourage the spirit quest along and. Were they sober? Yeah. Okay. Um, and also there's the fact that I'm very high, so things that they're saying aren't really making sense to me. Of course. Um, but. And you're not really making sense to them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because they're not even in your reality. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, um, so anyway, went off the road, took out a bunch of telephone poles and streetlights, I think. Um. Do you remember any of it? Yeah, I remember all of it. Okay. Uh, yeah, very, very intensely. And uh, the noise and motion stops and I open my eyes and I'm not, <laughs> I'm not out of the trip. Like I was never out of the trip. Uh, you're still in it. I'm in a wrecked van with crazy indicator lights and alarms and smell of shorn plastic and engine fluids and um, uh, Tiana's still in the seat next to me, terrified. Uh, and She was in the front seat. Yeah. And Ryan was in the back in the bed uh, with no seatbelt. Um he wasn't even in the vehicle. So. Uh, what did you do? I got out. I helped Tiana out of her door, which was screwed up. And uh, we found Ryan and he was very dead. Um, and... Uh, at one point, we were uh, brought by ambulance to the hospital. Um, me and Tiana were separated, and uh, I was interviewed by a lot of police officers, and I told them what had happened. I didn't. I didn't try to lie about any of it. Um, and I was arrested out of the hospital and brought to Jackson County Jail. Uh, but there's a lot more that happened in the hospital, actually. Uh, can we take a break? Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. Let me just pass the camera, okay? Okay. So um, let's shift gears a little bit, all right? Because mm -hmm. we were talking about some intense stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, where should we pick up? Let's pick up with, um, okay. How about, um, you left off with the hospital, the hospital. Mm -hmm. How long did it take for you to come down from your trip? Um, 
It was uh, pretty immediate, I think. It was immediate. Yeah, I was still in a little bit of denial um, when I was still in the van. And uh, certainly in shock when we found um, Ryan. Uh, I think the last of it kind of snapped when we were in the ambulance. That this is what happened and why. Um, so in the hospital and during my interviews with police and sheriff, uh, uh, I was actually very calm. Uh, it became pretty clear what had happened. Um, there was uh, a pretty profound experience laying in the hospital bed between one interview or the next in which uh, it felt like I was actually able to take a look at my life for the first time in five years and actually see myself ask myself well the fuck have you been man you've been gone for five years where have you been what did you fucking do like it <laughs> this is what it led to this is what you made of yourself like you wanted to you wanted to do good things. You wanted to help people. What are what are you doing? Um, that was the that was the question. It was like, where have you been? Where, where have you, I been? Where do you think you were? Oh, trapped up in all kinds of traumatic attachment and bullshit. Uh, spinning out and reacting to family stuff and social things and. Anxiety and depression and, um, uh, you know, in one sense, it, those experiences kind of put you at the center of everything. Uh, but, you know, in like a survival way, but you're also not really there. Um, you're not thinking with your, with a healthy mind or with your personality or you're thinking with nervous patterns and connections and traumatic responses to any stimulus. Um, You're in reactive mode. Yeah. Yeah. And you were stuck there because of trauma. And, you know, uh, one would think perhaps that uh, an experience like that leading into such devastation as uh, you know, finding yourself responsible for the death of a friend. Um, you'd think that it would just complete the deterioration of my mind. And instead there was just quiet and reflection. Um, I'm I'm at rock bottom, uh, but I'm here. Mm -hmm. At that time, laying in the hospital, it was it was just me, for the first time, not any, not any reaction, not any traumatized patterns or panic attacks or any of my past horseshit. It was just me there alone, thinking about what had happened, what I, what I had done with my life. And a sobering reality, right? Yeah. And of course it's a horrific reality to enter into. <coughs> um, Excuse me. But I also made some very important realizations that day. Do you remember uh, what they were? Yeah. Um, that I had no excuses anymore. That I have, like, now, for whatever reason, here, now, I have my mind back. And 
I I am surely traumatized by the accident itself itself and the experiences in jail and prison that followed, but um, it's different. And everything up to that point, up to the point of that accident, just evaporated. Um, what do you mean? I swear it was like none of it mattered to me anymore. They were things that happened. And... <laughs> and I could choose what to do with the rest of my life. Uh, I am, I am alive. I'm here. I have strengths. I have weaknesses and I've had the same goal since I was a child. Ryan was trying to help me accomplish that goal and he died for knowing me. Um, and there's absolutely nothing that I can think of that would bring me any satisfaction other than to accomplish that. And to do that, I need to identify who I am, my strengths, my weaknesses, and leverage or mitigate them respectively to accomplish the thing that I'm here to do. Hmm. And my, yes, jail and prison was hard, but I learned so much about who I am and I knew, I know why I'm here now. Whether or not that is like some predetermined like <clears throat> divine plan or whatever like i for myself at the very least have chosen a path and i don't i don't need anything else uh, i don't need to be a doctor or an engineer or um i don't need to join the french foreign legion and i don't need to be a professional surfer or whatever the fuck uh i <laughs> I have a very clear thing that I want to do and I'm going to do it and I'm going to jail or I'm going to prison or whatever the hell is going to happen. I'm going to, I am going to do this. Um, my life in prison was a hell of a lot easier than the few years preceding it. Really? Yeah. Why? Because I, I had my mind and I understood myself and how to how to stay in my lane, how to navigate as me, as with my skills and talents and the the abilities and resources that I have. Um before that day I didn't have that kind of self-awareness and so everything was just terrifying. If I have no sense of identity and no idea who I am or <laughs> what I am capable of and what I'm bad at, uh Everything's just terrifying. You have no control over your path or the day-to-day -day interactions and events that take place. But it's like having a reference. Here's a given challenge. Not like, what would Jesus do? Like, what would I do about this? Um, how how does Morlock confront this situation? What What skills and resources do I have available to leverage against this bullshit in front of me? Uh, it made things really clear. Yes. Um, so as much as one is able to, I did very well for myself in prison. Tell so. me more about that. Because I would doubt we were just talking, but that was not my experience. <laughs> it did not do really well um, myself. And I was there for fraction of the time that you were there uh well my my like driving force and fundamental talent is community uh that's making friends and understanding people and loving people um getting them to work together so that's what I did. I made friends and understood them and helped people. And they helped me. I built a community uh, of people around me from all different backgrounds, 
mm-hmm. different racial factions, different gangs, mm-hmm. uh, and it allowed me to stay pretty well removed from any of the prison bullshit, uh, like gangs and politics and racist shit. Uh, I didn't want to participate in any of that, so I didn't. Uh, and I left prison with a lot of very important connections that are still important today. People that I met in prison are working at Past Lives right now full time, like as leaders in the organization, um, helping other people. Uh, so you're already recruiting. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I just hired somebody full time today that I met at San Am Correctional Institution. Mm-hmm. Like while I was screwing around in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, he's joining our general contracting team. Cool. Yeah, he's extremely experienced and positive and wants to help our, uh, uh, one of our crew leads and our facilities manager, Nate, uh, I met at South Fork, um, the head of our prison outreach guild, Adam Gregg, I also met at South Fork. Our plumber is somebody that I met in prison, or, you know. Like, yeah. Um, so you believe in giving people second chances. Easy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, prison was amazing and inspiring. It, I mean, really gave me the opportunity to understand myself and then encounter challenges within my character and not anything else. The only thing that I had in there were, was myself and the resources at my disposal. Um, and there were some terrifying things. There was fights and violence and all kinds of political drama and gang bullshit and cops and a lot of stuff happening all at the same time it is yep. a it is a it is a richness of richness of complexity in and there. intensity yeah i've never been in such <sighs> intensity in my entire life it's like a pressure cooker uh-huh. i don't know about your living environment but i was like in a gymnasium mm-hmm. what i would attribute to a gymnasium like a dormitory like a bunch of bunks lined up with a ton of bunks probably at least if i had to guess 100 i probably knew at the time 100 to 200 women yeah which is never a good idea yeah that's it that's a- <laughs> women women <laughs> a whole bunch of women together with um all kinds of fucked up trauma mm-hmm. and yeah there were i think i was one of four there was A, B, C, D block, I think. Yeah. So there were a lot of women there. Yeah. Um, the, uh, dorms in the men's prisons that I uh, was at, I spent about half, no, uh, probably about a third of my time living in a cell. Um, and the rest of it was mostly in dormitories. Or when I was at South Fork Forest Camp, I spent a, a while in a cabin. Um, 12 person cabins uh, South Fork was a whole experience it's a prison labor camp in Tillamook Oregon centered on like reforestation forestry trails maintenance park maintenance and wildland firefighting so I was there for two and a half or three years or something um, what was that like uh, I mean fucked but why was it fucked? <laughs> I mean, it's all of it is. Yeah. Um, Why was that experience so fucked? <laughs> it, okay. And it, it also was like the best place for me. And a lot of extremely important and positive and inspiring things happened there. Because you were working out in nature. Uh, uh, yeah. And so, yeah, I didn't have to live indoors. Well, I, we still had places inside to sleep, but... Um, you weren't stuck inside with privileges being yanked at any moment. Yeah. The ability to go outside is like a fucking luxury for anybody who's in prison. Just yeah. For anyone who's listening right now. And for <laughs> and for most of the for most of the day at South Fork, you're able to just freely enter and exit your camp going. I mean, there's like a the yard at South Fork is like a park. You know, it's like a Beautiful pretty park. pretty yeah. decent park. Yeah. Um, and there's a river that runs through it and uh there's no like fences or gates 
there's little like split log, um, like three or four foot tall fences around some of the areas that just mark the perimeter. Um, and they just have a sign that says like, don't, don't do it. <laughs> don't cross this border. Yeah. Don't leave. <laughs> Um, It'll please. be bad. It'll end bad for you. Just don't do it, please. <laughs> don't make us chase you. Um, <laughs> oh, um, shit. Yeah, it was. Um, so why was it so fucked? Do you mind telling Because us? all of prison is fucked. And, uh, why is it so fucked? I mean, besides the obvious. Uh, for somebody who lived it. I mean, yeah, again, like racial and gang and political drama. What about the food? The food's pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's the best food I've ever eaten. Mm -hmm. Just kidding. Yeah, uh, food was trash. Um, you wouldn't. E I wouldn't even feed my dog yeah, the things that we were served. Um, most of my, like, mm -hmm. hustle in prison... Uh, was food? Was, yeah. Centered, centered around centered food? Up. Yeah, it was built around like acquiring. You were that person? Mm hmm I was. You were like the person that had a bunch of saltines and candy and all kinds of shit at your bunk? Well, I had all that shit, but I'm talking about like smuggled vegetables and spices and raw eggs and meat and things like to cook meals with. Um, what? Yeah. That was my game. I didn't care about drugs. Um, I consumed a lot of tobacco. But uh, <clears throat> my thing was food. That was... You wanted to eat well. Yeah. Yeah. I I was there and all I kept thinking is I would fucking starve if I had to be here longer. Mm -hmm. We were fed things like croutons and moldy bologna yeah. and I think we they had to provide a vegetable one night. They had white onion sliced mixed in the balsamic vinegar and that mm. was our salad and I was like <laughs> I'm sorry people but this is not salad but of course you can't say anything mm -hmm. we couldn't even talk during meals really you, nope we weren't allowed to talk wow it was intense we weren't allowed to talk we weren't allowed to do anything really Mm -hmm. I've never had such a complete surrender of control in my entire life except for maybe you know growing up with you know, the parents that I was raised with, but yeah, it's a complete, you feel like you have absolutely zero control. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd say the, the most, the biggest thing about prison that fucks it up is the prisoners. Um, the cops definitely play games and pit us against each other and like they don't help and they do make things worse, but. They totally fuck with you. Mm -hmm. They absolutely do. It's not even a made up thing. Like. Yeah. They fuck with you for fun. Yes, because um, they're bored and they hate you yeah. and they hate their job. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, right? Re really, it's it's like, and I and I don't even blame the inmates because if you put a bunch of people with fucked up situations in the same room and force them to be together and don't offer them any support, then they're going to be fucked up to each other. Correct. Um. So, people try to maintain their own sense of security and order by, uh, you know, distinguishing themselves from other races or gangs or political factions. There's, you know, the people that are like sex offenders is the people that are suspected snitches. And there's the people that are known snitches and people that belong to certain gangs, people that dropped out of certain gangs. Right. So there's a whole like hierarchy of shit going on. There's grannies who, <sighs> you know, are in there because they wrote bad checks. There's all, everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, there's like a whole social caste system in there and like you're supposed to like participate in it and be somewhere on that map. chain. You're supposed to be on that map. Yeah. Um, and then there's in Oregon anyway, like we call them independence, right? Uh, like you run with a gang or with a particular faction or you run independent. And that is typically the most challenging of the options available to you. Yeah. Um, and then people are always trying to like edge in on like the independents themselves. Like 
every once in a while there always somebody will pop up some asshole will be like i want to you know run the independence you know as if like the independence the opposite of what it means to be an independent some you know somebody will just like show up on your block and decide that he's the representative of the independence and it's like what the fuck are you, <laughs> Who are you? um there you the good news is like they're usually super dumb and like volatile and so it's only a matter of time before they get in a fight with somebody and they like just take care of themselves mm -hmm. um uh, <laughs> it was always great when entertaining not entertaining um it's sad uh but it it's like wow this person's been a problem for all of us and they've just worked they've just worked themselves right out yep um that's usually what happens anyway mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah uh, and yeah, so I mean, there's so much that I can get into about why I prison know, sucks. I know we could talk about that mm -hmm. for forever. So we were talking off air a little bit about our our comparing experiences, which mine is nowhere the same as yours, but the same existential dread of or hyper vigilance, or I don't even know what to call it of. Awareness of the panic that you're in. I was talking a little bit about surrendering control, right? You have mm -hmm. no control. Or you have very little control over your environment. How about that? And the absolute panic or fear around not getting out, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that was the scariest thing around is is what if this never ends and i was comparing it to my first uh, well probably my first couple of lsd experiences where you're so high that you're like is my mind ever gonna come back to what it was before i took this or am i ever gonna return to reality or is it already i'm am i gonna be fucked up and messed up for the rest of my life right yeah. mm-hmm yeah, I, I I had serious doubts that my acid trip ever ended. I mean, I went from the acid trip to this reality, being in fucking prison, and I I there was this weird illogical voice in the back of my mind that's like, no, homie, like you're in hell, like. Well, it's trip, a hell of your trip, own creation. Trip never ended. Like you're still there, and like yeah, you think you're getting out in two or four or whatever years, but like. See how you feel when you're still doing this in 700 years, like uh, when you're still at South Fork Forest Camp, being the librarian, building your business plan for when you get out. Um, Will you ever get out? Yeah. Am I ever going to get out? And so you'd see these like this terrifying shit happen to people where there are a lot of people in prison that have committed many crimes, right? And mm -hmm. so they'd be at like closing on the tail end of their sentence and then they'd one day- up. One day they'd get a call to the office and they'd get arrested again for new charges that developed while they were locked up. You know, found some DNA on some shit that got stolen or a break-in or a robbery or a rape or murder or whatever the hell. And they think they're about to get out of prison and... It gets yanked. And then they get yanked. Um, and even having no other, like, criminal activity on my record or otherwise just seeing that seeing somebody like a month away from the gate get fucking arrested actually arrested by police to go back to county jail for new charges was like oh my god that can happen yep that's a thing that happens to anything people. can happen because you're at the mercy of the court mm -hmm. And I learned that very quickly even just in my court experience you are at the I got I got the maximum sentence for everything that they could possibly give me. If it, if there was a part of it that could be maxed out, I got the maximum. It was like sheriff's work project, whatever it was, swap, I think is what it was called. I had to work on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. 90 days, mm -hmm. you're going to get 90 days. <laughs> like they were so pissed at me. They were so angry about me and my privilege and... Yeah, who I was and the fact that I was being reckless on the road. Mm -hmm. They really wanted to teach me a lesson. Mm -hmm. They really wanted to teach you a lesson. So there was a – at the end of my sentence, I was applying for the alternative incarceration program, which is some bullshit like six-month program that you do. And then when you finish that six-month program, the rest of your sentence falls off and you get to go home. 
Um, and I'm from Washington State. I was a Washington State resident, even though my crime was committed in Oregon and I had mm. to serve my time in Oregon. Right. And you're allowed to do AIP, it's called, even if you're an out-of-state resident, but you have to um, prove that you can have a residence in the state because there's a, a post-incarceration period. There's an imaginary post-incarceration period. You're right. There's some rule. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, where you're supposed to like take classes and shit after you get out. They don't actually exist. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of that too Yeah, in so my experience. Mm -hmm. I, I know that they exist for some people, but for the most part, I mean, no. Uh, so applied for AIP, demonstrated my, you know, my, my new address that I – that I had in Portland and these motherfuckers reviewed my application and they mixed something up and I'm, I'm like, I'm at the end of my time there, right? I'm supposed to be getting close to the end. And they saw that I'm a Washington state residence a resident and just like lazily going through my file. And somehow this lady, uh, misread it. And took that Washington State residence tag as an indicator that I had had out-of-state Washington charges. And so she denied my AIP application and just let me sit without a response for like five months. Usually takes like three weeks or something. So I'm like, okay, what the fuck's going on? What the fuck's going on? And I'm writing letters. I'm writing letters. I'm having my family call. I'm having the camp counselor try and figure out why this is happening. And then one day my camp counselor just gets like a, a incomplete sentence email referring to my out-of-state charges being the reason that I'm not eligible for this thing. And you're like, I don't have any out-of-state So like my greatest fear <laughs> is actually happening. It's actually happening. Right. And nevertheless, if you have out-of-state charges – like that you haven't been tried for, like you're not supposed to be at a minimum security prison, right, without gates or fences. So like I know that – I know in my mind that there's something wrong, that there's something fucked up. But a goddamn police officer or whatever the fuck she was sent an email saying that I have out-of-state charges. And I know that I don't. I know I didn't do anything else. And I know that I'm at a minimum security institution. I called my attorney. I had them run like a LEDs check, which is like a nationwide survey of charges – against an individual and like no you don't like you're fine dude like you know you know you didn't do anything else so relax <laughs> right but but she said <laughs> right she said that and it took them like weeks they let me sit with this idea of someone thinking i have out-of-state charges for fucking weeks before they responded They're like oh yeah sorry i confused it because you're Oops. an out-of-state resident right and then also it's just your life that we're fucking around with. Don't mind us. And so that that took like five or six months off of the amount of time that I could have saved from attending AIP. And then because I was delayed in entering the AIP program, halfway through my AIP program, fucking COVID happened and it got shut down. And I got delayed another few months. Um, so all of these different little things going on yeah, I thought I was never getting out. I thought this is what hell is. It's just like this never insane ending. bureaucratic little nonsense and clerical errors and shit. It is. That is the closest thing that I've ever come to hell on earth. It was of my own making for sure. But I would say the prison system and, yeah, the court system is a living hell that you <laughs> never want to get messed up with or involved in because – it's not for you. Yeah. I mean, you're lucky if you have an attorney that's for you, but otherwise, it's not it's not for you. Um especially if you've done anything wrong. <laughs> right? Yeah. You're immediately seen as um flawed and um you're immediately seen as a bad person and you're shamed for that. I think you're seen as a resource that at too. that point. I think at the point that you commit a crime that they can book you for, um, then 
They're leveraging you as yeah. a resource. They're leveraging you as a resource or at the very least uh, m using you to mitigate economic costs. Um, and there's some people that are real happy about it. Uh, I would agree because it keeps a certain amount of our population um, controlled or under their control. So you got out amidst COVID. You'd read 3,000 books while you were in prison. I don't have a number, a I specific mean, number. <laughs> I'm teasing you. <laughs> and you'd been studying up for creating this community your entire life, and you finally get out, and it's COVID. Mm-hmm. And you're in the midst of COVID and you're starting to build the thing that you've dreamed about or tried to create your entire life. And how did that go for you? So a lot of people were freaking out about COVID and how it felt like prison, not being able to do this or that. And, and you're whatever. like, I'm sorry, but no, <laughs> this mm -hmm. is nothing like uh, that. Like the quality of my life improved so dramatically going it's from prison to day. even... Even the middle full swing of COVID. Um, Same. Uh, yeah. Oh, I, was, <laughs> I was like, I can get through anything now. Mm -hmm. I've been preparing for COVID my entire life. Yeah. And in in reality, I think that, the, the, that I think that COVID was actually the perfect time for me to try and pull something out because mm -hmm. or pull something like this off because people were desperate for a community. Uh, like even if it meant social distancing and doing all the things like – which, you know, we stuck to. Um, <clears throat> uh, people wanted community. They wanted something to do. And past lives offered that for a lot of people when no one else was really f trying to take on the potential, like, social ostracization that could take place if you're trying to do social things and all that. I was. Yeah. Because um, I'm a rebel. <laughs> And I was having a retreat in Sedona, and I was like, fuck COVID. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can wear a mask. I'll wear a mask if you need me to. I won't touch you if you don't need me to, but we're getting together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people, we have to keep going on with our lives. Otherwise, you're just going to crawl up in a ball and give up. And I know what that's like. So here we go. Yeah. Um, so people wanted community. They wanted something to do. I started Past Lives and there was a great deal of community support around the idea of uh, creating n not only opportunities for people coming out of the prison system to build a career, but a space in which anyone can create, can create right? So we, me and people that I knew in prison and folks that I had just met after releasing, we got together and we started building a wood shop and a metal shop and community art spaces in this uh, building. Um, in Southeast Portland. Mm -hmm. yeah. In Southeast Portland. And then we started just taking on more and more space within that same building. And we outgrew it and started beefing with the landlords and they did some, some shady shit and uh, kept trying to get more and more money out of us. Uh, beyond rent and utilities, you know, I figured that, you know, we're 95% of the revenue stream were like, will they really just kick us out if I tell them to fuck themselves? Probably not. So I told them to fuck off and, uh, and they did, and they told me to get out. <laughs> um, so yeah, like a year and a half into building this organization, we had like 45 or 60 members or something. I don't even know. And a hundred tons of machinery and tools. Uh, then, all right. Well, you don't want to. You, you don't want to pay our randomly assigned extra money. Uh, fucking get out. You have four months. Um, and uh, we were fucked. Um, you've been fucked before. So, what did you do? Uh, I went on. Uh, the, an insane warehouse hunt. Uh, one of the most difficult times of my life. Actually. Is looking for the warehouse. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I don't have financial history. My credit is fucked from prison. 
my company can only like feasibly pay, you know, ten to sixteen thousand dollars a month for rent, and we don't have like more than two years of uh, tax return history, so we're not going to be able to qualify for traditional financing. We're not going to be able to qualify for a commercial lease. So, yeah, it's this this warehouse hunt where I'm I'm basically trying to get in touch with the owner of a warehouse and not their agent. Yep, not um, the property manager. Yeah, not their property manager. I'm trying to find somebody that owns property that gives a shit about anything. Um. And I found a few. I found a few people that would have let us move in, but the spaces really wouldn't have worked out. There was all kinds of zoning issues with some of them, and a lot of them didn't have any electrical outlay or any of the things that we would really need to run an art and industrial space. Um, and you know, maybe we could have survived. I know that we would have we would have ended up in a much worse quality space, and the place that we were in originally was already pretty trash. Uh, you know, great community there, but not actually built out or functional for what we needed. Mm -hmm. We made it work. Mm -hmm. Um, so <laughs> we had, I don't know, like a month left before our eviction and still didn't have like a solid place to go. I had some backup options that I didn't tell anyone about. Um, it felt important to me to have like a couple of tricks up my sleeve, not tell a single member or a single person about like this connection. Um, because I would keep telling people things in confidence and then somehow like it, it would circulate through. back to me. I'm like, okay, like, I don't know how I feel about that. Like there's this entity that would greatly benefit by me not being able to find a place to spit to stay because they they want our members and they want our equipment and they want our shit so that they can do what we're doing um which is what you know their offer was um uh that's a whole confusing thing i mean they could have just fucked us completely if they wanted to they didn't have to give us four months i guess i'm a it's a very complicated thing that I don't I still don't understand um thankfully you stepped away from it and you found a different solution yeah um and so you started past lives can you tell everyone a little bit about what you've created besides the 12 people that work for you it's a maker space you teach all kinds of classes you yeah so past lives now is a 12,000 square foot warehouse on ninth and Powell in Southeast Oregon, Portland, Southeast Portland. Um, and we have, uh, it's a membership based platform. So people come in and pay a monthly membership and they can access our space. We have a huge wood shop and metal shop and blacksmithing and welding and, uh, 3d printing and electronics and sewing and textiles and screen printing and embroidery and art framing and everything that you could ever want to make. Um, any artistic or industrial endeavor that you want to get into, we are like very well equipped. So people pay a monthly membership, they have access to our equipment, we teach classes and everything, we help people sell their stuff. And then like the big thing, the reason that we're able to accomplish our mission of creating employment opportunities for people coming out of the prison system and other similarly fucked backgrounds um, is in the actual work that we're able to do. So we have all of the space, all this equipment, and you know now over 100 people that know how to use it so we reach out to local businesses and individuals that are in need of remodeling or construction or, you know, custom furniture, or metal fabrication or whatever. And we form relationships and we set up work crews to serve the needs of our clients. And that's how we're able to create jobs and uh, get people trained and build the whole project management system. And uh, we're doing a lot. So, yeah, we have an amazing space. Um, we started a second company, Past Lives Construction, and now that's really taking off. Uh, we have two active remodeling contracts uh, going on right now. We've got a work crew working on a bedroom bathroom uh, today. And then, what day is it? It's Thursday. Day after tomorrow and Saturday, we're actually going on a site visit to Dave's house, Killer Dave's house of Dave's Killer Bread, because... Uh, 
two trees fell down fell down on his on his house and uh that's not good for the house no right no it's not good for the house so uh <laughs> what is the most reward okay you just dropped dave i don't remember his last name but doll Okay, Dave Dahl from Dave's Killer Bread for mm-hmm. people who are listening or watching. Okay, so he's involved. He helped you. Okay, I, I met his brother, Glenn, first. So Glenn is actually my investor and business partner in past lives. He signed on in the middle of our warehouse hunt and helped us guarantee the lease on a new building. Um, amazing. Saved our ass. And then we closed the lease on this massive space, uh, started building out all of our shops. And you know, I've been working with Glenn for... I'm bad at time now. Prison, the fucking, it sucks. So 10 months, six, 10, 10, I don't know, an amount of time. Yeah. And I just met Dave the day before yesterday for the first time. And uh, yeah, we got to show him around the facility and he's really interested in what we've got going on. He does, you know, he's very invested in second chance opportunities for people coming out of the prison system or whatever. Um. Amazing guy. His brother's amazing. Um, and yeah, so yes, uh, day before yesterday, I m- walked him out of the building and he introduced me to his wife and they told me about these trees that fell on their house and, you know, can you guys fix this? Like, yeah, we can. We, we And we can. Like, we have such talented people here. Yeah. People pay us to be a part of this thing and access our, you know, resources. So we have an amazing network of of makers and workers of all different skill sets. Right. Um, so yeah, we're just using these resources and trying to start as many different business ventures as we possibly can to leverage that huge common pool of resources and community. Um, is that the most rewarding part for you? Yeah. And then also like the team itself, um, seeing the team develop, seeing everybody understand and get better at their jobs. Um, we have, there's 12, 12 members and then there's a pretty large pool of there's, – there's 12 employees and and then a very large pool of members that we can draw on if we need other skills that we don't like currently retain in our employees. Um, so if somebody wants a you know, custom power supply or something, you know, some complicated bit of electronics, then we can do that. You know, we have some employees that can help manage the project and who have – some technical understanding. I have a little bit of engineering background, but we know within our membership that there are 15 people that can pull off creating that custom power supply for a client or 200 of them a week or whatever. Mm. Um, so it's, it's amazing. Uh, so seeing the actual team work together, um, this, grew really quickly and organically and most of us started out as volunteers um and we signed up for like little tasks here and there to take care of and there was a whole bunch of role overlap and ambiguity and you know we were getting things done but nobody really knew who like the point of contact was if there wasn't toilet paper in the bathroom or the point of contact was if the lights were out or fucking something um who handles financial stuff, who handles membership concerns. And so I've been really good about securing mentors, people that want to come and offer their expertise and experience to help us build a more organized team. And that's been going so well, um, turning this into an organization. uh, with Good for you for resourcing outside of yourself for the things that you don't know how to do. Yeah, there's most of things are things I don't know how to do. I'm, I'm actually I, suck at most shit. I know I do too, but my point is, is a lot of people don't recognize that they can ask or mm. that they should ask. They just get stuck in. They just get stuck in. This is how it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people assume that like if they don't know how to do something, then no one does. This is the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we just have to strive for it with it like <laughs> this. Where did you learn that from? <sighs> Prison, probably. Not taking no for an answer, or were you like that as a kid? Certainly that, but I think um, realizing that I don't know how to do everything and I don't understand everything very well reinforced by going to prison, which is an extremely foreign place for me. Um, well, it's a foreign place for everyone, isn't it? 
Well, there's a lot of repeat offenders. There's people. Okay, there's people, I see what you A mean. lot of people for whom crime and prison is their life. The bulk of their life is spent in that culture and environment. Agreed. Um, I forgot about that part. Yes. Um, so, yeah, like I said, I mean, like the, the primary thing that got me through prison was building community and making friends and learning how to understand that environment through other people's experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was humbling. I think that's the way you survived. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, and at first, it's through connection. I, I didn't. I didn't have that fully figured out yet. Mm-hmm. And I got my ass beat a few times. Did you? Yeah, that was great. It uh, was great. <laughs> the third time was pretty rad, actually. Um, what was so rad about it? Uh, this guy. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a, it's a whole thing. Yeah, I definitely lost the fuck out of the fight. And guy was, guy was huge. Um, but did he instigate it or did you? He instigated it for damn sure. Okay. I wasn't trying to pick any fucking fights with this guy. He was a monster. Okay. Um, but <laughs> uh, yeah, he was. Uh, he was trying to muscle me out of my cell. He. I was I was in a cell. He moved in, and he decided that he didn't like me because I woke him up one night because he was snoring, and we had already had an agreement about that. I wasn't doing anything crazy. Um, uh, and he told me that by the time that he gets back from breakfast that he wants me to be ready to leave the cell and go tell them Tell, tell the cops whatever I need to tell them. Tell them I'm going to commit suicide or whatever um, to get removed. And he came back. And I go, I'm, I'm not going to leave, dude. I'm, you know, we were at the intake center uh, at the time. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to leave. I'm going to prison, like, in less than a week. And I can't really afford to set this precedent. Like, you're a huge, scary dude. I get it. Um, uh but I, you know, I, I, I can't, I can't leave. You know, if I, if I do, then I'm trying to explain it to him, right? If I do leave, uh, then people are gonna know about it, and I'm gonna be a target for the rest of my time here. Like, well, I'm gonna beat your ass. I'm like, I know you are. Like, do it. Let's get it on. <laughs> um, and we did. And uh, he is. Uh, quite accomplished uh fighter uh, and i am not <laughs> so um yeah i got the shit beat out of me and uh we, i mean there were like five rounds in the in the cell um and at the end of it he you know he asked me for the fifth time like are you done about it? i'm like no <laughs> not F- fuck you dude <laughs> i'm not I'm not, I'm not leaving. Just fucking stop. And then he starts crying. Uh, yeah, the dude starts crying and apologizing to me. Um, he had it in his mind that I would just roll over for it. And because he had already drawn that conclusion about me, he didn't like me right because in his mind i'm the kind of person that would roll over for it but because i didn't he respected you he's he just realized that he had hurt somebody that was worthy of respect in his you know fucked up shit um he tells me i'm 30 fucking seven years old and i should be able to handle my problems better than this i'm so sorry like don't worry i'm gonna tell everybody what happened i promise you this is a good thing and it was um, it was the last fight I ever got in. Uh, like I am a, I was 119 pounds when I was arrested, right? I'm a very scrawny nerd. Uh, I did put on like 60 pounds okay, while I was locked up. Yeah. Um, the shit. <laughs> um, well, no, I mean, I, I got... I actually oh yeah you got good food I forgot about that no 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 it wasn't about the food I mean I exercised a bunch like I I was I got pretty into 
weightlifting and volleyball and track and everything that I possibly could to become physically fit. Um, I was, I mean, I was certainly tired of being 119 pounds. That was annoying. Uh, as a six foot tall man, that's not, <laughs> it's very thin. It's very thin. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I was a, I was a scrawny little ass in the beginning there. And, uh, but everybody outside, cause he had gone outside, you know, at breakfast and ran his mouth about how he's going to, you know, kick this nerd out of the cell. And, and then the doors opened up again during day room and people are walking by and people literally said, oh, well, he's still there. Like <laughs> what happened? <laughs> um, and, you know, to his credit, like, he went out and he told everybody that he's a fuck up and uh, that they shouldn't fuck with me or else he'll kill them. Um, and So he was like your bodyguard. Fucking, I guess. Or security. Um, Earned security. Yeah. Uh, so the whole thing was, like, kind of hilarious. That's why you were laughing. Uh, yeah. Um, and, you know, me, me and him ended up writing. Was it worth it? Yeah. Easy. Where'd you become so fearless? I think the day of the accident. It's, um, yeah, the day of the accident. I don't, I don't, I'm, I will navigate things the way that I have to. And I will do it. Whatever um, it takes. Yeah. Mm hmm. Um, and that was, I mean, sometimes it's irritating. Uh, Why is it irritating? Well, like I'm sitting in a cell and dude's out for breakfast and he's telling me that I got to like be ready to fucking leave when he gets back. And it's like I just get like 15 minutes to think about it. Like, am I really going to fucking fight this dude? I'm going to get my ass whooped like bad. Uh, fuck. <laughs> like, this is not. This is not cool, but like, what would I do? What what do I want my time to look like? What kind of person do I want to be? Um, do I want to just be scared all the time? Um, do I want to carry that with me for the rest of my life? Because I know myself. If I do something like that, if I roll over for some asshole, um, like, that'll be a part of my therapy later, right? <laughs> And then, and, and the whole world will be validating. And be like, no, you didn't do anything wrong. You, you know, it's, <laughs> you, you're, yeah, I, I, I let myself down in a bad spot. Like I was in a bad spot. I was scared. I was, you know, and I was in a, in a, I was in a dangerous situation, and I let myself down. That's gonna, I was gonna, that's how it's gonna read to me for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Um, and. Yeah, like, do I want future Morlock to just be, like, not confident and capable? Or do I want to feel like I'm a coward? Do I want to wonder, at least, um, forever? No, I don't. So, fuck. Like, I have to deal with this guy. Um, uh, You're really brave. I, um, so, in, in, in the end, yes, it did end up being a... a very good idea for me because it, it was like it cleared up everything so much because there were other people at that institution that transferred to my next facility with me and you still had the reputation yeah and it's not that i had like a reputation of being a badass or anything no. like that like i got my ass squarely whooped um but like at the very least it's going to be like it's all about annoying respect. and embarrassing for everybody involved if we have to get into a fight because i'm not gonna you know it won't be free. Uh, and no, I was never a tough guy and I never wanted to be, uh, but I could stand to get my ass whooped, I guess. Uh, <laughs> um, it, it forged incredible will within you, a will to survive. Yeah. I, I, I think it taught me how to do hard things. And do scary things because I knew that they were right for me. Um, I think it also taught you compassion, wouldn't you agree? For your own experience and for everybody else's? Yeah. 
me and that dude actually wrote letters to each other back and forth. We both got sent to different institutions. Um, and, uh, yeah, we were pen pals for a little bit. Very, very weird. Very weird. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, you were just, um, for a lack of a better expression or articulation, you were working out trauma together. Um, That's what relating is all about. <laughs> and prison is all about relationships. You've already stated that. Yeah? Yeah. What was the biggest thing that you feel like you learned from your experience because it's pretty fresh you've only been out of prison for two years mm. do you um, have enough hindsight now to see what that gave you yeah again i think it was the the same thing that i kind of came to on the first day of the accident was like coming back to you yeah center yourself know who you are find out who you are what you're good at what you're bad at and find out what your objectives are and fucking use the things you have and don't have to do the shit you want that mm. is that is really it. And don't tell any don't let anyone else tell you a different version of yourself or Yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> don't get confused. <laughs> yeah. So real clarity. Yeah. And you know, it, it definitely let me navigate prison and pretty much eliminate all of the shit before it, like from my mind. I just didn't have any use for it anymore like past experiences and trauma they, they were no longer they were no longer useful um uh-huh so you don't find uh, it useful the way that i was relating to them at least absolutely not yeah i i get that for um, sure uh I, all it ever did was harm me and keep me from moving on um it's formative though it's made you who you are you couldn't be the person that you are now without all of the things that you've overcome. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the, and P, and it, like the lesson kept popping up in like different different ways and different phrases in in prison. One of the things that like my first friend in in jail told me his name was Rashid. Um, he said, "Find your lane and stay in your lane," and that rung true because just two days ago I'm sitting in the hospital bed like thinking about just that mm -hmm. um and he clarified too he said don't i don't mean stay in your lane like mind your own business like stay in your lane like f find out who you are if you're if you're a tough guy be tough if you're not don't if you're smart if you're cute whatever the fuck it is like own it don't yeah. try and be anything other than who you are yeah be authentic be um, real be true mm -hmm. yeah that literally is it like we make it so complicated, don't we? Yeah. Um, I yeah. I don't want to be. I don't want to be a tough guy. I. Uh, I don't want to be mean. I don't want to scare people. Uh, that's not my. That's not my strength. Um, so I won't. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I have any other questions. Let me see. Hmm. Is there any old idea of yourself that you're outgrowing? Any old idea of myself that I'm outgrowing? Um, I'm certainly challenging a compromised perception of my own self-worth lately. That really does seem to be the limiting factor in my capabilities as a leader. Um, is do I, do I deserve to lead? People, people do respond to me. People do um, trust me, and they like my ideas. And you know, me and with their help, we're able to build a pretty tremendous organization in a very short yes. amount of time. But like, am I really worth that? Um, so every time that there's this like period of growth that the organization needs to take. It requires a pretty grueling, excruciating amount of growth from, from me, right? It always involves sacrificing pride or fucking working harder or being more scheduled or uh, trusting people more or whatever it is. There's 
so much pressure on me to grow as an individual um, to serve the, the organization or the company. Uh, and uh, I, I've, I've spent the last couple weeks especially because there's some really tremendous growth happening right now with mm. the development of the design build like construction firm that we've started and the number of people that are involved. Um, I've recently hired an internal operations manager uh, to manage all of our department leads for um, marketing, finance, facilities, IT, um, uh, classes, but all the all the stuff that's like focused on the building. Operations, yeah. Um, so that I could focus on external ops like sales and construction and manufacturing, subcontracting. I'm good at meeting people. I like people. I want them to be a part of the thing. Uh, and when I can focus on that, I can do a really good job of it, and I can create a lot of money for the organization, and I can thereby create opportunities for people that need them. Um, you are really good at that. Yeah. Um, but do I really deserve that kind of excellent team? Right? That's the thing that eats at me. And Why? So Ryan trusted me. Ryan was all about this idea. Um, and in, in my mind, it amounts not only as a failure, like as a friend, but a failure in leadership and carrying that with me still today is like, well, you can't be a good leader. You're a fuck up. You fucked it up. Someone died. You killed a kid. You killed your friend, you motherfucker. Um, Can you forgive yourself? Not yet. I know it shouldn't be conditional, but it's as far as I've come so far to know that I have a thing I've got to do uh, before that can fully happen. I don't. Do you feel like you have to redeem yourself? <sighs> Um, I have to complete the thing that 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 Ryan was trying to help me build. Um, I need the organization to break even without investor support. I need it to become profitable so that it can take care of itself. I need to hire strong staff so that no matter what happens to me, the, the thing will be fine. The community will persist and be able to grow and develop and expand and multiply um, whether or not I'm alive to experience it. At that point, I think that I will feel okay mm. about myself. Mm. That that was the dream. The dream that was the, the promise that I made to Ryan after he died. Um, it's okay um yeah mm -hmm. I understand I still think you're really brave <laughs> um and I appreciate you being so vulnerable thank you mm-hmm At the end of your life, Morlock. Sorry, were you going to say something? No, okay. nothing, nothing useful anyway. <laughs> it's all been useful. Come on. At the end of your life, is there anything that you want to be known for standing for or have given to this world? Uh, community. I, I think. I think in our current system of capitalism uh, that community is dying I think it is dying um, and what's taking its place is a horrific amalgam of individualism and social media and shitty jobs and uh, 
destruction of environments and consumerism and it doesn't do anything for anyone it's a weird self-perpetuating autonomous machine that like everyone's a part of and no one's driving and uh, uh i want to build something that at least has a chance of helping to combat that um it's admirable it's a really big gift to the world Yeah, and it's working. I know it is. So you're trying to provide connection and a way of loving others more and probably a way of loving yourself more. Yeah. I want I want people to understand that they they do have worth and there is a place for them in community. Um, that the way that we're living right now is not natural. It's not how we're supposed to be. It's not how we evolved. And because of that, we're like we, we're alone. We're not supposed to be alone. We feel unsafe. As my friend Andrew says, like it is unsafe to be alone on a biological level. If, if you're alone, you, somewhere in you, your body knows you're not safe. Um, so we're all anxious and fucked up, and we think it's our fault. Uh and all of our self-worth is compromised, not just mine. You know, you don't have to be an ex-convict. It's just a universal and pervasive thing. I know very few people that are actually happy or who claim to have any self-worth. I know I know centimillionaires who are dealing with very serious self-worth challenges. Yep. Um, Doesn't matter who you are. And I think at the root of it, it's that we don't exist as a part of a community. Uh, we exist as individuals in a system that just evolved somehow. I don't, I don't know. Um, empire and capitalism, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. self-perpetuating pockets of power, and uh, it doesn't do anything for anyone. Yeah, it's definitely shifted um, significantly since I was born in the 70s. Yeah. Um, the idea around community or the idea around connection in some ways we're so connected but in other ways we are not Yeah, and we lose our sense of connection or our sense of purpose in this world or why we're here or yeah it's a lot of people who feel lost most fucking everyone I know. Um, mm -hmm. The twelve people that are working full time at Past Lives are the twelve like happiest and most inspired people I've ever met. Uh, it really is an amazing thing to to build something so fucking huge and rad with people you care about. Yes. And like to uh, all of us recognize how much each of us has grown yeah, in our roles and in fulfilling. our jobs. It's super fulfilling. Yeah. It does feel natural. It like it does feel like the way we're supposed to be a part of community. Mm -hmm. We each do have a place mm -hmm. and we support each other. Mm -hmm. It's uh, like family. Yeah. Yeah. It's chosen family. I still hope I'll be able to bring all my people back together someday. I'm not you know, quite wealthy enough to pull it off, but most of my family member, members aren't happy. It really is just like economic circumstances that are preventing them from being able to, to be together again. Still, they're still trapped in it 28 years later, 21 years later. Um, they're, they're even more scattered than they were before. Mm -hmm. And it's just fucking money. Mm -hmm. And know. organization. Like it, What we're proving right now with past lives is that... You, you don't really need that much money if you can get organized and trust people and have communities and positive systems. Like, you can pull off crazy shit. Um, we're a bunch of broke-ass artists and criminals, like, <laughs> do, doing something rad. And legitimately, it's like... And, but you're more powerful together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's totally, it's totally possible. And I... I yeah, you're proving the impossible possible. 
And it's silly because I just really think it's just the way that it's supposed to be. I think that these these drives and systems are encoded within us. We know how to act. Um, there's just extremely significant survival pressure from empire, essentially. In society, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. Is there anything that you wanted to ask me that came up along the way? Um, you want to have that drink? <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah, but let's turn off the the rest of it and, and finish it for today. Does that work for you? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your story with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for sharing it with anyone who's listening or watching and I appreciate you. I appreciate you too. This is an amazing space and a really cool thing you're doing here. Thank you. I really appreciate your support.